Hello, my name is Chris Dyson. I'm Renter Warden uh, for the Liv Architects Livery Company in the City of London. And this talk is prepared on behalf of the Temple Bar Trust, an educational charity within the Architects Livery Company. And the talk is entitled, This City is Made of Water. So the first aspect of this talk is a tour of the city. Medieval London in 1200 had a population of 20,000 people and by 1600, 200,000 people. The primary water sources of the, of the city were the River Thames, the Fleet and the Walbrook and a few shallow wells in between. By the 14th century the population rose sharply and the city was cramped with with no culinary water and wastewater separation. The water supply was polluted with human waste, industrial effluent and animal remains, for example at Smithfield Meat Market. Ale was drunk instead of water. The water remained contaminated until the 19th century, at which point 6,000 Victorians died from waterborne cholera epidemics in London. So, this is the course of the Walbrook. This, this sculpture by Christina Inglerius um, illustrates a version of the medieval riverbank of the Walbrook with its tendrils of the, of the landscape feeding into the riverbed. By 1598, the Walbrook had completely been submerged by buildings as the city was becoming much denser than it had been ever before. And in the 18th century, when the Bank of England was built, the Walbrook was discovered in the footings of the bank. Today, the Walbrook runs in a culvert all the way down to the north side of the Thames. The Great Conduit runs along Conduit Street here. And this tablet on the floor marks a position of the conduit, as was discovered during the construction of Number One Poultry so here we are outside number one poultry, which was designed by the late and great James Sterling and his partner, Michael Wilford and Lawrence Bain. So in 1236, a great conduit was planned, which came along here and ended at this point in number, in number one poultry. That conduit was made of timber with a 90 mil circular hole drilled through it, which was lead lined and that allowed for the passage of water through into the city from the West End. Wealthy landowners tapped into that, but there were also illegal tappings. And those um, illegal tappings led to a drop in pressure. So over time, that conduit became flawed and other solutions were sought. So the conduit was actually siphoned off the River Tyburn and led down into the city from the Tyburn, which originated at Marble Arch. It's worth mentioning the New River Company, which has connections with the city and supplied water to it. The New River Company had a chequered history, but finally was able to implement its plans with the help of James I, who became an equal shareholder within the company. The New River was completed in 1613, and it was a significant engineering achievement, although the straight line distance between the springs around Ware and New River Head was about 20 miles, the actual route was just over 40 miles. So this pump was built in 1799 by Nathaniel Wright, architect, and the first pump in this position um, was commissioned by the Mayor of the City of London, Henry Wallace, Mayor of London in the year 1282. So this is, this is the first example of pumping water by hand using the hand pump here and the water being brought out here into cobs which were wooden buckets which would then be transferring the potable water to various properties around the city. And there were many of these in the city at the time and this is one surviving example which is rather fine. 
in its Egyptian design, as you can see. So one thing that's worth noting is these pumps were funded by major contributors at the time, the Bank of England and the East India Company. And without that funding, these pumps would have been extremely difficult for the city to afford at the time. The Bank of England and the East India Company continued with their interest in funding water into the city until very recently in the 1900s. And um, we'll see other examples as we go around the city later today. So this design of St Mary and Magdalene was designed by John Robertson, architect, and uh, is a fine example of high Victorian Gothic in Portland stone and granite. And here at the centre is the fountain for drinking and for dogs at the lower level too. So by 1859, um, a Victorian MP, Samuel Gurney, had established the Metropolitan Drinking Water Fountain Association. And within 11 years, there were 140 fountains such as this one here, which was actually built to celebrate the Jubilee in 1859. And those fountains provided water not just for humans, but also for cattle, for horses, and even dogs. Um, and there are a huge variety in their design. And this one here in pink, granite, and bronze is a fine and elegant example of those fountains. So in 1879, this sculpture here, La Maternité, um, is carved and made in bronze by Jules Dallow, tops this wonderful quattroporte kind of design where you've got the four steps and the four uh, basins, all made in granite. And it is a fine example of placemaking here in the city. So these fountains weren't just serving as a practical function, they also provided space for people to relax and enjoy and talk and communicate. And that couldn't be any more uh, important today and see where people sit for lunch and enjoy um, a little bit of respite from the street. So this fountain was the gift of um, Alderman Ellis and the Broad Street Ward and was commissioned by John Whitaker Ellis and William Hartridge of the Drapers Company and the Merchant Tailors Company. The architect was James Edmonston. So here we are in St Paul's Cathedral churchyard, St Paul's Cross, an Art Nouveau inspired design of 1910, designed by Reginald Blomfeld, architect. Um, a combination of stone and slate as it rises up to the image of St Paul. So at the base of this St Paul's Cross, on the west side of the balustrade, is the Art Nouveau mounted drinking fountain, featuring a sculpted angel and a large basin. The sculptor was Bertram Mackinall. So here we are outside the great monument, a huge column which was designed by Sir Christopher Wren, surveyor to King Charles II and the architect of St Paul's Cathedral. He designed this with his friend and colleague, Dr Robert Hooke. At that time, there simply wasn't enough water able to be pumped around the city to put out the fire, which went on for several days. These fountains here um, are one of, one of eight which were commissioned by the City of London in 2010. So this is a contemporary, very minimal design found drinking water fountain designed to take the bottle underneath um, and to um, replenish the citizens of the City of London. So here, as a final image, the potential for the future of water fountains in the city. This one, designed by Zaha Did Studio, illustrates the potential to provide really wonderfully designed landmark features which mark spaces and places in the city. 
and provide the citizens with fresh drinking water. Just thought we'd introduce this um, piece of sculpture which Wren commissioned when he renovated the uh, cathedral into its current state. After the Great Fire of London, this phoenix was um, emblazoned on the side of the cathedral with the words Resurgam, which means we shall rise again. And in truly this did happen, the city of London has risen again from the Great Fire and will rise again on many other occasions of that, I'm sure.